Hello and welcome to the microwave engineering lecture titled One Port Networks. In this lecture, we will learn about why it is useful to perform network analysis. We will learn about equivalent voltages and currents, the concept of impedance, one port networks, Foster's reactance theorem, and the properties of impedance and reflection coefficient as functions of frequency. Recall that in circuits operating at DC and low frequencies, the circuit is small relative to the wavelength. The currents and voltages are unique and defined at any point because there is no phase delay between components. In this case, electrostatic approaches to Maxwell's equations and the well-known KCL and KVL techniques are applied to analyze the circuit. However, as the frequency increases, the wavelength decreases. And at microwave frequencies, these tools cannot be used directly. However, basic circuit and network concepts can still be applied but must be extended to account for the wave nature. This is way easier to apply than solving Maxwell's equations for the same problem. Usually, field analysis solves electric and magnetic fields everywhere in space or in the system. This is many times unnecessary, as we may be only interested in the currents and voltages on the conductors, at only some points on the on device, at a set of terminals or connections, etc. This approach is also difficult to modify and correct, as usually a tiny change in the system leads to another full simulation. In contrast, network analysis is really easy to modify the problem or combine several elements together and find the overall response without having to redo the simulation. Network analysis is also very easy and inexpensive to implement. However, this approach is a simplification technique and there are instances in which this oversimplification may lead to wrong results. It is our duty to be able to determine in which cases network analysis applies and which other cases field analysis is better. Here we will define some basic parameters like voltage and current for a TEM two conductor line, which is defined here, where the red lines are the electric field and the blue lines are the magnetic fields. For this case, we can obtain circuit parameters like voltage, current, and impedance from Maxwell's equations. In this case, the voltage is defined as the line integral of the electric field the current is defined as a closed contour integral of the magnetic field, and the impedance is defined as the ratio of voltage to current. However, determining these parameters in devices like waveguides is more difficult. For example, this is a waveguide that is showing the fundamental TE10 mode here. This is a cross section of the waveguide with the dimensions shown in the XY plane. This is an animation of the electric field as a function of position z. Remember that in your waveguide lectures, the transverse field components are given by these expressions, where this is the y component of the electric field and this is the x component of the magnetic field. We can obtain the voltage by applying the same integral to the electric field as with the arbitrary TEM lines. We obtain this expression for the voltage. Now notice that the voltage is dependent on x and also on the integral of y. Which leads to the question, which voltage is the correct one? If we integrate different lengths of y, we will arrive at different results. And the answer is that there is no correct solution for the voltage. Now we will look at the different types of impedance that we've seen over the past topics. This is eta and it's the intrinsic impedance of the medium given by the square root of mu over epsilon. We have also seen the wave impedance which is equal to the ratio of the electric field to the magnetic field and is also the reciprocal of the wave admittance. We have also seen the characteristic impedance the admittance, which is the reciprocal of the impedance, 
which is also the ratio of the voltage over the current. Now we will look at impedance properties of one port networks. In order to do this, we need to recall Poynting's theorem, which is given by this expression. PS is the power supplied through the port. The closed surface integral of E cross H is the power transmitted through the surface. P sigma is the power dissipated by ohmic losses. And the expression 2j omega times wm minus we is the total stored energy, which can be magnetic, which is defined by wm, and electric defined by we. Now, the complex power dissipated or stored by a complex load is given by this expression. As a function of frequency, it is equal to the voltage times the conjugate of the current. We remember that voltage is equal to impedance times current, so we can write this in terms of impedance and current to arrive at this expression. Now the impedance can be separated into resistance, inductance, and capacitance as follows. Given this, the power stored in a purely inductive load and a purely capacitive load is, respectively for the inductive load, given by this, and in the capacitive load, is given by this, which is similar to the previous expression that we saw earlier, where this will be the magnetic energy, this will be the electric energy. Recall the negative sign. Now we will go from electromagnetic waves to circuit parameters. The fields in the terminal can be written as this, where this is the expression for the electric field and this is the expression for the magnetic field. Now we need to find A and B. The amplitude functions A and B are normalized such that at the interface, the integral of the surface, the cross product of A and B is equal to one. Now in terms of waves, we can substitute for E and H into the integration to have this expression. Now we are ready to move from wave parameters to circuit parameters. Starting from this expression, we can substitute E for this and H for this. Now we can move VZ and IZ outside of the integral and recall in the previous slide that this integral is equal to 1. So the expression for power is equal to this. Now we will derive the input impedance. Recall that the impedance is equal to the real part, which is the resistance, plus an imaginary part, which is the reactance. In the same case, the admittance is equal to the real part, which is conductance, plus an imaginary part, which is susceptance. The input impedance is defined as the ratio of V over I. We can multiply by the conjugate of the current to obtain this expression. And recall that V times the conjugate of I is equal to 2P. Remember that P is equal to this expression. And so the input impedance is equal to R plus JX, which is equal to this. Now, the real part, R, is equal to the dissipated power given by 2P sigma over I squared, and X is the reactance, which is the energy stored, which equals 4 omega times WM minus WE over I squared. Notice that for capacitive loads, WM is less than WE, and thus the value of X is negative. For inductive loads, WM is greater than WE, and thus X is positive. Now we will look at Foster's reactance theorem, 
which states that the reactants and susceptance of a passive and lossless one-port network always monotonically increases with frequency. In mathematical terms, it means that the partial of the reactance with respect to frequency is always positive, and the partial of the susceptance with respect to frequency is also always positive. And here is a graph showing the behavior of a one-port network reactance. Now to prove the theorem, suppose we have a load with inductance, which is stored magnetic energy, and capacitance, which is stored electric energy. In this case, the reactance is given by this expression. Jx of omega equals to j omega l plus 1 over j omega c. Getting rid of j gives us this expression. If we take the derivative of this function with respect to omega, we obtain this. Now we will look at even and odd properties of the impedance and reflection coefficient as functions of frequency. Consider driving a one-port network with input impedance z of omega, which responds to a current i of omega. The Fourier transform of a real-valued function must have Hermitian symmetry. Since the time domain voltage and current must be real, then v and i have Hermitian symmetry, leading to these expressions. Notice the negative sign here in omega. This means that the voltage and the current also satisfy these expressions. Applying these to the impedance, which is the ratio of voltage to the current, shows that it must also have Hermitian symmetry. Now for r of omega, which is the real part of the impedance, and x of omega, which is the imaginary part, we obtain this. This means that the resistance as a function of frequency has even symmetry, and the reactance has odd symmetry. Applying this to the reflection coefficient shows that it also has Hermitian symmetry. Recall the formula for the reflection coefficient. Now, the impedance is a function of frequency. Splitting the impedance into its real and imaginary parts gives you this. Now, if we invert the frequency axis, we obtain this, which is equal to this. Which means that the magnitude of the reflection coefficient squared as well as the magnitude are even functions.